الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومي ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين إن شاء الله we're continuing to cover the issue of the أمانة which we started last week and hopefully we'll finish it today the subject is so involved and so powerful that it takes you by storm of information and points to consider. Al-Amana comes from the root word Amina. Amina. That's a root word. The same root for Iman. The same root for Iman. The same root for Amn. So security, trust, and faith are tied together in one root. All of them come from the root of Amina, which is to feel safe and to feel secure. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented the Amana to the heavens, the earth, and the mountains, and they refused it, He tells us that we accepted it. Humans accepted this Amana. The word trust refers to varieties of things. It's not one item, and it is not a list of items. It's basically a concept that permeates and covers and engages every aspect of our life. The word you speak is an amana, and the word you do not speak is an amana. The time you speak is an amana, the way you speak is an amana. I'm talking about only speech. In the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, it may be a word that a person would utter that may lead him into hellfire for 70 falls, which means 70 years. Imagine a word. You swore by Allah and you know that you were hiding something, you were not telling the truth. This is called Yameenun Ghamus. Ghamus means it immerses the person who says it in hellfire. تَغْمِسُ صَاحِبَهَا فِي النَّارِ أَعَذَنَ اللَّهُ وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنَ النَّارِ So from the word you say to the action you take to the ideas that you share everything is an amana. Everything is an amana. Amana means what? That Allah has given us powers to deploy, to use, and faculties to employ, to get things done in our life. الذي جعل لكم السمع والبصر والفؤاد إن السمع والبصر والفؤاد كل أولئك كان عنه مسؤولة. The hearing, the sight, and the heart are all trusts that Allah will ask us about. Which means what? Whatever runs in my heart that may influence my action, right? That I will be asked for. If I turned into action, I will be questioned about this action. And because you are rewarded or punished based on your intention, not just the action, but the intention behind the action is what determines will, will you be rewarded or will you be punished? In the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بالنيات. Actions are compensated based on the intention behind them. So some of us misunderstand 
the, the concept of the hadith, the concept of the hadith is not saying that intention is the only thing that matters. Intention is the foundation and the action is the structure you base on this foundation. Intention is the foundation. It gives you the motive and the reasoning and the logic behind what you do and what you say. Then comes the actual thing which is what you say or what you do. Together they constitute whether you will be rewarded or punished. So sometimes a person may want to steal a bank. But as soon as he comes close to the bank, he sees a couple of police cars. So this intention is not going to be very helpful. So what does he do? He changes his intention. Right? Because it's harmful. Likewise, if a person intends to do the same thing, he wants to steal a bank. And he goes to the bank and there are no police cars. But he remembers Allah. So he changes his mind again. Because the action is going to be harmful. Not here, but in the hereafter. So he changes his mind. When he changes his mind the first time, is, does he get rewarded? No, he changed it for fear of the dunya punishment. But the second time he changes his mind, he's doing it for fear of Allah. Does he get rewarded? So the two intentions result in one and the same thing, but he is rewarded for the second, but not rewarded for the first. Likewise, if I treat my wife well, because her father is the minister of, right? It's different from when I treat her well because I fear Allah. Because I want to consider her for what she is. She is my trust. Likewise, a wife who serves her husband, not just because he is spending on her, or he is taking care of her needs, but because it is her amana to take care of his needs. This is a different thing. So anytime we treat the amana with Allah in mind, the reward is tremendous. Anytime we do one and the same thing to deal with the amana, but the intention is not for Allah, we lose our reward. So it's one and the same thing. It is like when the Prophet Sallallahu says, <coughs> وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً In the intimate relationship you have with your spouse, there is a charitable element. Then they said, Oh Prophet Muhammad, do we get the pleasure of satisfying our desires and we get a reward for it? Look at his answer. He says, أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ وَضَعَهَا فِي حَرَامٍ أَلَا يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِ بِذَلِكَ وِزْرِ If he does the same thing, satisfies his desire in a haram way, does he get a sin recorded on him? They said yes. He says, likewise, if he does it in the appropriate way, according to the rules of Allah, he gets rewarded. Everything we do could be rewarded based on how do we put it in the proper context? So, on the Day of Judgment, and we said this last week, but I will repeat it. On the Day of Judgment, the first three people who will be thrown into hellfire, may Allah protect us all from hellfire, are people who have done great works in their life. One of them spent a lot of money. The second is a mujahid. The third is a scholar who was teaching people. So Allah would bring them and call them. What did you do? So the man who had the wealth he said, Oh Allah, I spent it in your path. I spent all my money in your path. He says, No, watch what you're saying. You spent it so that people would say he is generous. He is on the top of list, the list of donors. We cannot do anything without him. And they said it. That's the reward you th sought. That's the reward you get. You have no reward with me. The second, the mujahid. 
I fought in your path until I got killed. They said, no. You fought so that people would say, this man is very brave. He's very courageous. They said, that is your reward with them. You have no reward with me. The scholar who was teaching people, you taught people so that people may say, he is a scholar, he is this, he is that, marvelous, amazing. That's what they said. That's what you get. You have no reward with me. So you need to get the idea behind the intention. Mundane things that we do every day can turn from useless things that we do into one of the most reward generating aspects of our life. When you eat, when you sleep, when you nap, when you take a rest, and your intention is to do what you're doing to regain the power to worship Allah, how much does it cost you? We all go to bed every night. Who makes the intention that he is going to rest, to get ready for a second day of active worshiping, active service, active compassion, active help to all those who are needy around us? So the intention makes the difference between day and night. One of the amanat that we rarely pay attention to, let alone take care of, are the weak members of our society. Those who are in need of others to help them, whether it is an elderly person who cannot carry the stuff he is taking home, or it is a sick person who cannot help himself, or a woman who is widow with children or divorcee with children, and she cannot fend for them because she has the young and the younger and the youngest. All of these people are ours to own them, to become their real family. Whom are those people left for, by the way, to take care of? They are left for us. They are assigned in our collective name. As we have in Islam what is called Fard Ayn and Fard Kifaya, the individual responsibility and the communal responsibility. The individual responsibility, nobody could do it but yourself. Nobody's going to pray on your behalf. Nobody's going to fast for you. You have to do it. Nobody's going to take care of your family for you if you are able to fend for yourself and for your family. That's an individual responsibility. Your relationship with Allah is up to you. What do you want to do with it? Nobody is going to help you with that. So you have to have the will, you have to have the knowledge, you have to have the resolve to straighten up your relationship with Allah on your own. And if you need help, seek help from your surrounding, but make sure that you will finally have to do it yourself. Let me make this more clear. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No sinning soul will carry the sin of another soul. I hope this is clear. Could a woman deliver a baby for a pregnant woman? Or the pregnant woman will have to deliver the baby. Right? That's her responsibility. That's her baby. Right? Likewise, what Allah assigns to you as an individual responsibility, if you could not do it on your own, you need to define what help you need and ask people to help you. But you have to do the basics. That's individual responsibility. So if a family has a sick member, they are the primary caretakers of that member. You cannot say, I will not be able to do it because, no, you have to take care of him. If you need help, then reach out to others. And whomever you reach out to, they know they can help. It becomes also their communal responsibility as a group. Communal responsibilities 
are like the following. Salat al-Jum'ah. This is not could be done. This could be done by one person. It has to be done by a community. Some scholars put the number down to minimum of 40. Some go down to three or four. Some go to more numbers. But what constitutes a community is a group of people who live together in an area that can gather in a place and do the Jum'ah. Simply put. So what is our responsibilities as a community? As a community, we have a lot of things to do. Yes, it is an individual responsibility to raise your children the way you are supposed to, but children could not be raised just by the family. They need the sheltering and the institutions of the community to absorb these children and to give them whatever they need. Education, training, skills, language, deen, everything has to come from the community. So the children are a communal responsibility. But as far as finance, safety, health care, clothing, food, they are their, their family's dependents. So now we have part individual responsibility and part communal responsibility. Like responsibilities are divided into individual and community responsibility, likewise the amanat we have. I hope that everybody knows his individual responsibilities. But there are communal responsibilities that are not assigned to your name. So the definition of the communal responsibility is a collective responsibility that one individual cannot do by himself or herself. Like this country, if we don't have an army of people, we cannot defend the country. That's a communal societal responsibility, right? Likewise, if none of us clean the masjid, right? It becomes a community responsibility for all of us. And unless, until it is covered, it becomes an individual responsibility. You see the turn? So we are sitting here taking dinner in Ramadan. And everybody eats and leaves. Who's going to clean up? Then it becomes an individual responsibility. It is not a communal responsibility. Part of what makes our community always lagging behind is that we confuse this by throwing the community responsibilities on others and not taking our share. If everybody takes their share, the communal responsibility is well taken care of. So one of the communal responsibilities that I want to bring to your attention is the responsibility for those members of our community who cannot afford living expenses because they are physically and or mentally handicapped. We have members, we have actually families in our community who fall in this category. We have members in this community who fall in this category. We have people who are physically impaired. They cannot walk. They cannot even move themselves. They cannot turn themselves right and left. They need the help. Who's taking care of them? Some. But when this some is unable to offer them all they need, then it becomes a communal and individual responsibility. So things change. Somebody was a handicapped child. The father that used to fend for him passed away. And his mom has younger children to take care of. This child needs some support. So his mom can take care of so much then what about the rest? So we have people in our community 
that have time to donate and volunteer. So we need a huge army of volunteers to take care of such needs. The easiest thing and the most difficult thing is the financial help. The easiest if we do it, all of us. And the most difficult when everybody says someone else has that responsibility or someone else can do more than I could. Do your share because you will be asked about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Anfal, Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu, la takhunu Allah wa rasul wa takhunu amanatikum wa antum ta'lamun. If you know there is someone who needs community help and you do not suffice their needs and you do not bring it to the attention of the community as a whole or at least your circle of friends, you become responsible about that case yourself. And it becomes a betrayal of amana when we see somebody in need and we pass by as if we have seen nothing. This is what the Quran is referring to as khiyana lil amana. It is a betrayal of our trust. Allah entrusted us to take care of certain people and certain duties and certain responsibilities. And those become the responsibilities we will have to answer for before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even well before the commission of him as a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was known for two qualities. As-sadiq, al-ameen. The honest and the trustworthy person. Alayhi salatu wasalam. He was known for this. Even those who did not believe in him, they left their valuables with him when they traveled. And the story is known. When he was leaving from Mecca to Medina in his migration, he left those valuables with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anh, to deliver it to their respective owners. Some of them were standing to kill him at night. Some of those who have their valuables with the Prophet, they sent their sons to assassinate the Prophet sallallahu But trust is trust. Some of us today, they take a loan and they say that the lender said something bad about me, I'm not going to pay him. You can't do that. This is his sin. Don't create your own sin. It's his mistake that he speaks ill about you. But at the same time, don't make your own sin by not delivering what you owe to someone who helped you at the time you needed. So sometimes we confuse issues just to skip responsibility and to make as much material gain as possible. That is contrary to the life and the model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala guide us all to follow his model and to understand our faith. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Brothers and sisters Some of the amanat that we are asked to take care of is testimony الشهادة. and to give the right testimony based on knowledge إلا من شهد بالحق وهم يعلمون شهادة is a word it's a statement and it's part of the amana you are entrusted 
without shahada, there is no system of justice. All systems of justice depend on a truthful, honest witness that gives all the facts he or she knows, not all the facts that he imagines. So a witness is not allowed to say, I think. We don't want your conclusion. We want what your eyes had seen. That's all what it is. We want what your ears have heard. That's all what it is. A witness is not a person who does analysis. A witness is someone who conveys what the judge could not have seen. So you want to bring the judge to be himself as if he has taken your own shoes, as if he is with you at the time of the incident. Some people, when they call witnesses to the court, they coach the witness. That's what I want you to say. No, no, don't say it this way. This is not allowed in Islam. And some people witness for things they did not witness. They heard from one side or the other, and they go to the court and they say, this is my testimony, it is not your testimony, and it is a false testimony. False testimony is equal to false swearing. Both lead directly to hellfire. Some people, when asked about somebody, they give not facts, they give ideas. I think he is. I think. Don't give facts. Don't give your own facts. Give real facts. There is a story, I don't know if we said it last time. A man who came to testify on behalf of another <coughs> in the court of Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar asked him, uh, you're testifying for him? He said, yes. I think your foundation is, you've seen him praying in the masjid. He said, yes. And your foundation also for testimony is that you've seen him reading Quran in the masjid. He said, yes. He said, have you traveled with him? No. Have you slept at his place or he slept at your place? No. Have you had any monetary transaction between the two of you? No. Umar al-Khattab whipped him and told him, get out. You cannot be fit as a witness. You don't know him. You don't know a person, which means do not recommend him, do not witness on his behalf. Be honest. So that you become trustworthy. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to keep our trusts, it doesn't only refer to money that somebody leaves with me or a gold valuables that he leaves with me. No, it is everything that I have to deal with falls under the amana. And the amana is what heavens and the earth and the mountains refuse to take responsibility for. One may tend to think that the amana is your conscience plus your free will. Because together they help you make the right decisions. Together your conscience and your choice will help you or hurt you the most. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us keep our amana. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا سوءا فاصرف عنا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا 
واجعلنا من عبادك السعداء اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا فقيرا إلا أغنيته ولا كريما إلا أخلفته اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين أجمعين وارحم موتانا وموتى المسلمين أجمعين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأقم الصلاة